How you doing, everybody? And welcome to another edition to Israel Bible Study. Inst uh oh, what happened? Uh, what this thing here. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully I'm on. Well, welcome to another edition of the Israel Bible Study Institute, where our objective and our aim and our goal is to bring biblical literacy to a biblically illiterate world through the reading of the Word of God. Uh, First and foremost, let me state and start off by saying all praise, all honor, and all glory to, to the Most High God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's through Him whose name we worship. Glory be to Him and all praises. As you said, my name is Noel Berry, and this is, uh, I'm a facilitator of the Israel Bible Study Institute, where our goals and our objective is to bring biblical literacy to a biblical illiterate world through the reading of the uncut Word of God coming from the King James Version of the Bible, leaving our denominational beliefs, preconceived notions, and ideologies at the door and just reading the Bible as it is, without having, without having any filters or anything for which the Word of God must go through. Also, we don't interpret, we don't interpret anything. We just let the Bible interpret itself. Uh, I just want to go ahead and jump right into it. Over the last several weeks, I've been putting together certain lessons that are really building upon each other. And with today's lesson, we will deal with a, a topic or that usually comes up. And when I deal with people, and the reason And the reason I decided to wait till the fourth, because I was off and I off, I don't have to do any work, and it gave me enough time to thoroughly go through this subject by scripture, but scripture is scripture. That when I get finished, we will thoroughly have a complete understanding or a better understanding of this topic. And in, 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 in the, in the topic's name is simply remembering the Sabbath and keep it holy, or worship on Sunday. Which does God command? Which does man teach? The title once again is Remember the Sabbath and Keep It Holy or Worship on Sunday. Which does, man, which does God command and which does man teach? This, this lesson is born out of conversations that I had with numerous different people. And whenever I ask them what day they go to church on or when do they worship or we speak about the Sabbath, it always comes... Uh, one of several things, depending on who I'm talking to, some people will say, well, they don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. Jesus did away with the Sabbath, so the Sabbath is no longer around. Or some will say that, well, the Sabbath is the Jews thing, and that's on a Saturday, but uh, the Christian Sabbath is on a Sunday. Or they go on and say that uh, Paul moved the Sabbath to a Sunday, and other people will say that, well, every day is the Sabbath. Uh, we can worship on any day that we choose. And these are basic. These are the basic answers that you would get for a person who worships who worships on a Sunday, and they have certain scriptures that they go to to justify their belief that they worship on Sunday for. And these scriptures is one of the things that we're going to analyze and go over. But for the most part, what we're going to do, we're going we're going to thoroughly analyze, analyze everything. We're going to even see how Sunday worship came into being and who brought it into being. But first, I'd like to start off with finding out what the Sabbath actually is, according to the Bible. Because if you ask a lot of people, just, just their statements alone, well, we could, the Sabbath is every day. You have people say the Sabbath is every day. Well, we're going to find out about that, and we're going to begin at the beginning. So, we're going to start at Genesis 1 and find out about what the Sabbath is. Genesis 1 and 1. It said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We're going to skip down to uh, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. 
and the evening and the morning were the first day. So this is the first day that we have, a day that we associate with being the first day of the week, where we're dealing with the creation, uh, the creation story. So let's skip on down to verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters from which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So now we have another day completed from which God did uh, created something. So let's keep on verse, uh, verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the land, dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and gathered it together of the waters called the seas. And God saw that it was good. Let's skip on down to 13. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So now we have another aspect of creation being done on what is known as the third day. Skip to go to verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the from the day, to die the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for a light in the firmament of heaven to give light unto the earth. And it was so. So let's let's go on down to the, uh, verse 19. And it, the evening and the morning was the fourth day. So now we have another day that was created and some aspects of that day and the different things that was involved in that day. It's verse, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has light and fowls that may fly above the earth in the open firmaments of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moved which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Skip on down to verse 23. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So now we have the completion of a five-day period, or five periods of what we would call time, and each period had something being engaged in that time frame. So let's keep on. Verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So then we skip on down to verse 27. And, and we'll say, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Let's skip on down to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the six days. So now we have six increments or six periods of time for which in each period of these times, God did a particular thing. So now let's go to Genesis 2 and pick it up to verse 1. Let me get a better marker. All right, that's all right. Genesis 2 and verse 1. Thus was the heavens and the earth finished, and all the hosts therein, all the hosts of them. So on the sixth day, or at the completion of the sixth day, everything that God made or was going to make had been made. It is complete. So the creation of the heavens and the earth, which God spoke about in Genesis 1 and 1, is complete. It's over with. There's nothing else to complete. So let's continue on ver uh, verse 2. 
And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had made. So the seventh day, God created it specifically for a day of rest. The only reason that the seventh day, according to this, each, each day that we've seen leading up to this, there was something done in that day. There was some type of work done, some type of aspect of creating done. So, realistically, if God wanted to, he didn't even have to create the seventh day because there's nothing to be made in the seventh day. He could have just started the week over with, then with the seventh day, it would be the first day. But instead, he created a seventh day for rest. And it says, verse 2, And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested the seventh day from all of his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all of his work, which God created and made. It said, And God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. Now the word sanctified means set apart. So we take the word sanctification and add on to it more than what it is. Sanctification means to set apart, to remove. If you have 15 marbles and you take five of them and put them to the side, then you have sanctified these five marbles because they are no longer within the group of these other 10 marbles. Well, what makes... The seventh day of the week sanctified or separated from the other six days is because there was no creation done on that day. That was a day of rest, not for God, but for the future man. And because from a creation standpoint, there was no reason for God to create the seventh day of the week because he had already made everything at the end of the sixth day. But God has blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. So the seventh day of the week, and what we call the Sabbath, is an ingrained part of the creation process itself. If you remove the Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, from the week, then you are disrupting the very nature of creation itself. But there's a couple things I want to highlight right here before we move on. The first thing is this. There was no Jews here at this time. For those who say where the, where the Sabbath is for the Jews or the seven-day Sabbath is for the Jews, there was no Jews here at this time. A Jew is a descendant of Judah. Judah was one of the 12 sons of, of, of the uh, patriarch uh, 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 Israel, whose name was Jacob. Jacob was a son of Isaac. Isaac was a son of Abraham. See how far down the line we are from this man being made on the sixth day to we come to the first Jew, which is Judah and his sons, the descendants of him? So to say that the, that the seventh-day Sabbath belongs to the Jews is incorrect because the seventh-day Sabbath was around before any of, that, any of them came into existence. The second thing I want to point out is that it says God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now what I need for somebody to do who believes that the seventh day is no longer blessed and sanctified and that the seventh day Sabbath has been done away with or that the first day now is the day that the Lord has set aside to be working. What I need for somebody to do is show me in clear, precise, and unambiguous language where it says that the seventh day is no longer blessed and no longer sanctified. Or show me where it says that the first day of the week is blessed now and sanctified. Because if you cannot show me, and this, I, you, I don't want you to show me something and then you have to explain to me. No, because I'm not explaining anything right here. This clearly says, verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day. No interpretation, no translation, no understanding. God blessed the seventh day. God is, there's nothing to say more no than that. God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. So if God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it and we don't find anywhere else in the Bible where he said he did, he, he, the seventh day is no longer blessed and no longer sanctified, then that means that the seventh day is still blessed and sanctified. Simple as that. So let's move on. Now, that is what the Sabbath is. Now let's get into some, the codification of the Sabbath. 
You see that the Sabbath is the very part of the nature of creation itself. So let's go to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, and we're going to pick it up in verse 8. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It's the Sabbath of the Jews? No, it didn't say that. It said it is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of everything that lives, breathes, moves, talks, or even exists in this universe. So if this is his Sabbath, then it should incorporate everything within his creation. The God of Isaac, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not just the God of them alone. He's the God of everything. And if he's telling them who are supposed to be his priests in another lesson, I'm going to show you that, who are the vessels for which his word is distributed to the rest of the world. If he's telling them that the Sabbath, the seventh day is the Sabbath and it's a day of rest, then he's telling that to the rest of the world also. Because if it wasn't from if it wasn't for these so-called Jews right here distributing this word to people who are non-Jews, then we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now because no one would be knowing anything about the Sabbath. But it says, verse, uh, verse uh, 10 again, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no, thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservants, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, there we have some instructions given in a codified form now. Now, people might think, well, they said, well, that was Moses doing. He gave the law and all this. But I'm going to show you that people understood the law. The law, we just have it in this form right now. Because the law right here is supposed to be distributed from these people into the world. But I'm going to show you that the law has been around long before Moses even came up with this. So you cannot call this the Mosaic law. Let's go look at this. First, I want to identify something. Let's go to John. Let's put a mark. I got my mark. Oh, yes, sir. I got all my markers ready today. So let's keep a marker right here in Exodus 20. And let's go to 1 John. We're going to go to 1 John and four, and we're going to get some identifications done. We're going to get a, uh, some identifiers in place so that we'll know what we're talking about when we see certain words. So we're in 1 John 3 and 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. What law is this? The law of God. So if you transgress, if anyone transgresses the law of God, he has committed sin. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's word of God. That's not my word. That's not my opinion. This is the word of God. If a person commits sin, he is transgressing the law. And that law is God's law. So therefore, now we have an identif identifier to which we can identify things and have an understanding of what things are being said when we are reading them. Now, let's go back. Now, let's go to uh, let's go to Romans 5. Let's go to Rom Romans 5 real quick. Now that we have this identification, we're going to go to Romans 5. And verse 12. Romans 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed on, passed upon all men, for, for that all have sinned. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. So it's saying, so Paul is saying that, hey, by this one man, sin entered into the world. And I think, ah, oh, I don't even have it in my lesson. Let me let's see if I can just grab it real quick. 
Let's see if I can grab it real quick. Let's see if I can grab it real quick. No, that's not it. Maybe it's eight. Well, anyway, it says. It says the wages of sin is death. But I didn't put that in, in there, but I just want to point out, it said, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world. So one man broke God's law and as a result of that, sin entered into the world. Well, we're going to find out who this one man is and what his law was that he broke. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15 real quick. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to pick it up at 21. For 1 Corinthians 15 and 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of death. And this death was the result of sin. It says sin, I mean, uh, uh, the wages of sin is, the wages of sin is death. So if you commit sin, something has to die. So let's keep on. It says, for as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So there's one man who brought sin into the world, and as a result of him bringing this sin into the world, which is a transgression of God's law, he brought death into the world. So we're going to find out how Adam brought this sin, or what, it was, what, what law did Adam transgress in order to bring this sin into the world. And with it, he brought death. So let's go to Genesis 2 real quick. Genesis 2 and verse 16. Genesis 2 and 16. And the Lord and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So this is a commandment right here. This is an order right here. This is an ordinance. God said not to do something. And he said if you do do this, the consequences for you doing what I'm telling you not to do is death. So we're going to see what happened. God gave man, and this man is Adam, God gave man a, 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 an order. So let's go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 and 6. And when the woman, this is after this is after the, uh, the Satan had lured Eve to a, a conversation with him and inquired about whether they can eat of any tree of the garden. And then she told him, no, we can't eat of any tree. We can eat every tree, but this one tree. And Satan switched it up and saying this and that. And she said that and this. But anyway, this is where we at right here. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the tree that the Lord forget, forbid it, Adam not to eat, the man not to eat of, and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And she also, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So now, Adam just got through doing what God told him not to do. What he did was eat of the tree for which God told him not to eat. And as a result of that, now the punishment, which is death, has entered into the world. The sin was the disobeying of God's law or transgressing God's law. What was the law? Not eating of this particular tree. And what is the consequence of that? Death. So therefore, when it says that sin entered into the world by one man, this is the one man, and that sin that entered into the world was his disobeying God's commandments, which was not to eat of this tree. So, Let's go to uh, Genesis 1, I'm um, Genesis 4, excuse me. I'm just showing you that before we, people like to say that this is the Mosaic law, we start talking about the Ten Commandments, but I'm just showing you that before Moses even put all this stuff into a codified form that we have today in the form of the Ten Commandments. See, the Ten Commandments is kind of like in America, we have the Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution. See, the Bill of Rights all other laws hang upon the Bill of Rights. See, they create laws daily in every state within inside the Union. The, the Federal Congress, they create laws that govern the land. 
But all these laws have to conform with the Bill of Rights and the United States Constitution. That's why we have judges, really, Congress can come up with any law they want to, but what they, if it does not conform with the Bill of Rights or the, or the Constitution, then the judge is going to shoot that down. So the Ten Commandments are, as Jesus said, on these two, not being just two commandments, but he said, love, thy, love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love thy neighbor as thyself. That incorporates all the Ten Commandments. If you read the Ten Commandments and have a clear understanding of it, but the point I'm making is that the Ten Commandments, all the laws, these 600 something laws that they said is too hard for them to keep, that's what all of them descend from. So therefore, when we see the Ten Commandments, people think that this is the Mosaic Law, but I'm going to show you how these laws were being in existence prior to Moses putting them into the Ten Commandments as the commandment of God. So we're in Genesis 1, Genesis 4 and 1. And Adam knew, and, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, "I have begotten, I have gotten a man from the Lord." Ooh, that's not adding up. Yeah, I. So. And and she again burned his son, his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first end of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and his offering, he had no, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrath? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire and Thou shalt rule over him. So what sin is this that lies at the door? Sin is the transgression of the law. So it means if you do not do well, then you're going to transgress some laws. But what laws? It had to been some laws in effect for even them, even for them to offer sacrifices. They must have had understood or been informed of some type of law of ordinance of how to sacrifice because it said that Abel came with the first the first one of his flock whereas Cain might have just picked something up out the ground and brought it to the Lord and it wasn't accepted because we're supposed to bring the first fruit we start reading Leviticus and in uh in numbers about the the sacrifice the sacrifices and the offerings that are supposed to be done but this stuff was done this stuff was spoken of prior to it being written in the word or given to the children of Israel. Cain and Abel knew about it then. Let's go to, uh, let's get some more, let's get some more of this. Let's go to Genesis 18. Go to Genesis 18 and 20. This is during the time of, uh, of Lot and Saddam, uh, S -S -S Saddam and Gomorrah. Saddam and Gomorrah. And the Lord is fixing to destroy, destroy uh, or is fixing to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But let's look at it. Let's look at it. Said Genesis eighteen and twenty, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. What sin? Sin is a transgression of law. So they're transgressing some laws. So obviously there were some laws in place that the Lord had put for all mankind to follow at some particular point in time, whether He had given it to them through. Uh, 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 agency of the angels or whatever, or they came up with all, still they was in sin, so they transgressed the law. So this law was before Moses. And what law was, we know there was transgression against? Sexual immorality. If a man lies with a man, as he lies with a woman. If a woman lies with a woman, as he lies with, uh, as he lies with mankind. Read that in Leviticus. That is the laws. But how did they know it back here? I'm just showing you some things. 
Let's go to Genesis 31. So I like going, I like putting things together like this so that well he just read one verse and now it's multiple places it said from the law to the testimony said from here little and there little line upon line precept upon precept I'm showing you different aspects of show approval point that before Moses codified the law in the form of the Ten Commandments and all the other laws that came afterwards there's been law there's been law Go to uh, Genesis 31 and uh, 31 and 19. We pick it up and start at verse 19. And this had to do with Jacob when Jacob was worked for like 14 years for for Rebecca, but he was tricked to work work all the uh, extra seven years. So in his time, he gets ready to leave. After fulfilling his uh, term of the agreements that he had with Laban, which is Rebecca and Leah's father, there's always some foolery and trickery going on that's, that's keeping him here. So he steals off in, in the night. He's like, man, Laban, man, Laban done went out of town to take care of some business. Man, let's go. Pack up our stuff and we're getting up out of here. So this is where we at in verse 19. And Laban went to shear his sheep. And Rachel had stole the images that were her father's. And Jacob stole away unaware to Laman, the Syrian, in that he told him not, not that he had fled. So when Jacob is burning off, his wife Rachel grabs some idols that was in the house or in the household that belonged to her father, right? That's 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 thieving. That's that yeah, that's that's they stealing. So let's go to verse 30. Now, after uh, Laban found out about it, uh, Abraham burning off, he done chased him down and everything. So now we have verse 30, and it says, And now though thou wouldst needs be gone, because thou soarest longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said peradventure, thou wouldst take by force thy daughters from me. So they don't caught up with it. Now let's go to 36. And Jacob was wroth and charged with Laman. And Jacob answered and said to Laman, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? What is my sin? What does he know? What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. What law was transgressed about? His daughter, Laman's daughter, stole some images that Laman had. And if you go on and read that stuff on yourself, you'll see that he searched, he searched all their goods and the tents and didn't find, didn't find the idol. But I'm just trying to make a point to show you that this law was around prior to the so-called Mosaic law. Let's go to third. This is our last place, and then we're going to get back on track. I'm just establishing groundwork and foundation right now. Genesis 39. Genesis 39 and verse 7. Now this is dealing with Joseph. Joseph was sold, uh, uh, sold into uh, slavery in Egypt by his brothers and a wealthy man, I believe he was in the military, in Egypt in the military, and a man of means and influence bought Joseph and put him over his household. And he began to see how a lot of his stuff began to prosper because he had Joseph in his house. So then he left everything in Joseph's hand because he's seen that Joseph's character was of such a standard that he don't have to watch over him or check behind him to make sure this and that and that. It was done because the Lord is blessing him just by being in association with Joseph. So now let's see what happens while he was in a, oh yeah, then, then the, uh, the ruler of the house, his wife started feeling some type of way towards Joseph and wanted to have sex with him. And this is where we at right here. Verse 7, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wants not what is with me in the house. Man, this man done put me in such a high position in this house, he don't even know what he has in this house. But he trusted me. 
100%. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. Everything that he has in this house, he has trusted in my hand because of my character, because of my integrity, and because the Lord has been blessing this man through me. Let's go on. There's none greater in this house than I. Hey, man, I'm top of the top, and then all these other servants are up under me. Neither has he kept back anything from me but thee. The only thing that he has not allowed me to have is you. I cannot be with you, right? So then he said, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What does he mean? What sin? Adultery. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. That's adultery. This was a law that he knew about. And he said, he said, he said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So therefore, brothers and sisters, when he talk about, let's go back to verse, I mean, let's go back to Exodus 20 and verse 8. So therefore, when they talk about, well, that's the Mosaic law, well, that's the law, that's the that's the laws of the Jews. No, 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 no. This law has been around long before. Joseph was not a Jew. His brother Judah was the pro, pro, procreators of the Jew, but Joseph was an Israelite, right? Abraham, I mean, excuse me, a, 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 a Jacob was not an Israelite. He became Israel after this time. Cain and Abel, they had four, 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 uh, 34 people on the earth. But they knew about this law because the law has always been the fact. So now we're going to look at look some more at this. It says in verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no do thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. That is what the Sabbath actually is. Now, we're going to get some ordinances besides this to show some other things that occur on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. The seventh day of the week was the day, the seventh day that the Lord created. He blessed this day and sanctified it. And like I said, until somebody can show me in the same clear, precise, and unambiguous language that the seventh day is no longer blessed and sanctified, then that means the seventh day week is still blessed and sanctified, brothers and sisters. It's just like a law in the land. Until, until Congress repeals a law, we still have laws on the books dating back to the 1930s. But those laws are so outdated and so ancient that people don't even realize, but it's still on the law book. And if somebody want to write you a ticket or to enforce that, you may not, not may, nothing may come about it, but it's still a law until it gets repealed. So let's let's go on to Exodus uh, 23. Exodus 23 and 12. Just doing some reinforcement. Six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest, that thy ox and thy ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and the strangers may be refreshed. So this is a day of resting, a day of refreshing. Right? So we already shot one bird out, the, out, out, out that tree about... It's the June 7. Now we get into another aspect where people say, well, every day is a Sabbath, right? Well, every day you're not resting. Every day you're not you're not doing no every day you can't you got to do work someday in order to maintain your livelihood. So how can every day be the Sabbath day? We're gonna keep on going with this this thought process. Let's go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, because along with a rest, he gives us something else to do on the Sabbath. Leviticus 23, and pick it up in verse 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye should proclaim to be holy convocation, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You should do no work wherein it is the Sabbath of the Lord. It is the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwellings. So not only are you supposed to be resting on the Sabbath, but you're supposed to have a holy convocation on a soul Sabbath. What is a holy convocation? A holy gathering. You're supposed to have a holy gathering. So, you don't do any work on the Sabbath. You're supposed to have a holy, a holy convocation or a holy gathering on the Sabbath. But if the Sabbath is every day, then when are you going to work? When are you making your money? And why aren't you having a holy gathering every, every day of the week? If every day is the Sabbath. Do you understand? If, 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 if you honestly believe that every day is the Sabbath, and you follow the Sabbath according to what the Lord said the Sabbath is, there's no way that this society would continue to exist because no one would be doing anything every day of the week. And we'd just be up in the church house. That's foolishness to say that every day. When people speak like that, that shows you the importance of a true Bible study program because like I said in our opening remarks and our mission statement, to bring about biblical literacy to a biblically illiterate world. When people say that, it's because they do not know what the Sabbath is. Well, every day is a Sabbath. Do you know what the Sabbath is? Yeah, well, it belongs to the Jews. No, it don't. We just read that it's the Lord's Sabbath. Let's go to, uh, let's go to, let's go back to Exodus 31. Exodus 31. Exodus 31. And we're going to pick it up. Verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say, Verily, my Sabbath. Who is my? Who is this my? The Lord. It said in verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say, Verily, my Sabbath. Ye should keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So what, how is keeping the Sabbath the sign between his people, Israel, and those strangers who grafted themselves into Israel, those strangers who will fall up under the commonwealth of Israel? How is keeping the Sabbath the sign? Because it, sanctif it sanctifies you. And how does it sanctify you? And we're going to see this sanctification in a few minutes when I get into my next part of this lesson. But it sanctifies us now because while everybody's going to church on a Sunday, while everybody's working all throughout the week, even on the seventh day, his people are being identified by those who are keeping the Sabbath holy and not doing any work on the Sabbath. Now you have people, I sometimes I have to work on the Sabbath, but I'm forced to because I'm living in a land that is not living under jurisdiction. If, if we was living in the land under the jurisdiction of this, there would be no working on it. Just like when they erroneously believe that Sunday is, a, is a, and we're going to look into that. We're going to see that too. But like Chick-fil-A, the owners of Chick-fil-A, because of their belief that Sunday is the day of rest that is spoken about in the Bible, they shut their businesses down. All Chick-fil-A's are shut down on a Sunday. If we were living in the land where this was the, this was the standard of the criteria and the standard of judging right from wrong, then yes, everybody would not be working on a Sabbath. But what's sanctified when you see a person, that's the first thing they're going to ask. You go to church, or what, you a Jew? Or you a seven-day Adventist? That's the first thing that comes to their mind. Why? Because they understand that the Sabbath, although erroneous, is for the Jews. But no, the Sabbath is for everybody. The seven-day of the week Sabbath is for everybody. And when you're keeping that, that is what sanctifies you and sets you apart from everybody else who is not keeping it. 
Let's go on. Let's go. Let me show you an example of for those people who say that every day is a Sabbath day, showing that it can't be every day. Can't be the day. Every day can't be a Sabbath day. They also said, "Well, I can worship." Yeah, you can worship on any day. You're right. You can go to church on any day. You're right. But God said, "You better have a holy convocation on that seventh day." That's what you need to do. He has ordained a holy convocation on the seventh day of the week. You can go have a holy convocation on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth days of the week also. But you darn better make sure that you're there on the first day of the week. I mean, excuse me, on the seventh day of the week. Let's go to Nehemiah real quick. Let's go to Nehemiah 13. I'm going to show you about every day is the Sabbath day, how that's that's impossible. So we just line up these duck, line up these pigeons on this on this on this power line and shoot them down one by one with the word of God. The first one we shot down is that the Sabbath was the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath is for the Jews. We shot that down because it says it's the Lord's Sabbath. The second Sabbath that we're working on right, the second pigeon that we're working on right now is the one that says that well, every day is the Sabbath. He already hanging by one one foot right now, but we finna we finna bang him up off that pole right now. So Nehemiah thirteen. Nehemiah thirteen. And, and we're gonna pick it up at 15. This one Nehemiah after, after the Jews were able, after the Israelites were able to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem after the captivity of being in Babylon and uh Media Persia. And they began to rebuild Jerusalem and, and the temples and stuff like that. This is during that time when Nehemiah comes across them doing a particular thing. Verse 15. In those days saw I and Judah some treading with wine press on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath. So he sees some people working on the Sabbath. And bringing in sheaves and laden asses. As also wine, grapes, and figs. And all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day when they sold victory. So you have all manners of business and commerce going on on the Sabbath day. Just like any other day. So how, so how are you able to differentiate between the day the Lord set aside for rest if every day of the week and sanctified it, if every day of the week is the same thing, all type of business transaction is going on. It's just going on throughout the whole whole city, as it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. This is what Nehemiah is protesting about. So then, he goes on verse sixteen. There dwelt men of Tyre, also then, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath? Did not your fathers thus? So this is what, well, let me finish it. And did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? So all this stuff is going on on the Sabbath. Jeremiah said, hey, man, you violating the Sabbath, you profaning the Sabbath, and this is the exact same thing that our forefathers did, which caused God to put his foot on our neck by sending Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to cart us off to captivity in Babylon. And now, now we don't came back hundreds of years later after the Lord done let us come back. Now you picking up what our fathers left off at, doing the exact same thing that they did to get us caught off into slavery, to get caught off into our captivity. You think this the same thing ain't gonna happen to us that's doing this right now? That's what he's saying. You're doing the same thing that they did that got them busted in the head. Now you come back and doing the same thing. You don't think God gonna bust you in your head? Come on, let's go and read about this. What what did Einstein say? He said insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Each time. That's insanity right there. We just came up out of this. It's just like a person in prison. You went to prison. You went to prison for standing on this corner. You, a, a corner of 
jailing cross timbers, sell, selling dope. You go to prison for 10 years. You come back out, and on the first day out, you go back and stand on the very same corner doing the very same thing that you did to cost you 10 years of your life. And you don't think that you ain't going to go back to prison when these people run up on you? That's insanity, man. And that's what he's talking about right here. Let me pick back up at 18. Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded the gates to be closed, shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. So he's shutting the city down. Okay. I can't control them cats out there. I can't control because it says up here, it says in verse 16, there dwelt men of Tyre. Also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. So they had people who were not Jews or who were not Israelites, who were not up under the covenant of God, who were not living by the ordinance of God. They were violating the Sabbath, although they didn't know, know nothing about the Sabbath. They were bringing their stuff in. But you know about the Sabbath. I can't control them, but what I am going to do, I'm going to control you because you bringing this drama upon us and we just got through rebuilding this city after being destroyed for doing this very same thing so this is what's going to happen man when the sabbath come in at night we're going to shut these gates ain't nobody going to bring nothing up in this city until the sabbath is over with that's what nehemiah is saying right here in verse 18 i mean excuse me in verse uh 19 and he said and it came to pass that when the gates of jerusalem began to be dark before the sabbath i commanded that the gates should be Shut and charge that they should not be open till the Sabbath till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of were large without Jerusalem once or twice. So now after, after Nehemiah then shut the city down on the Sabbath. Okay, so these people trying to come to the city and, and do what they normally been doing is selling their wares, selling their, their merchandise on the Sabbath where they can't get inside the city. So what they do, they post up along the wall. They post up along the wall and start hawking their wares. You know what I'm saying? They did this once or twice. So then once Jer uh, uh, Nehemiah gets a hold of this, this is what he said. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why are you lodged about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more to the Sabbath. So Nehemiah had a story that had his, hey man, if, you, if you, you post up outside this wall on the Sabbath again, I'm going to bring, you're going to get the business. Keep on, you, you post, come, come up here next Sabbath and watch what happens. And they didn't come out there no more. But the point I want to make is that if every day is the Sabbath, You see, see how you see how crazy this sounds when people start saying things and you start trying the spirit, which is their words, by the spirits of God, which is this book. And you see, how can every day be the Sabbath when you can't work on no day? And if you can't work on no day, how are you keeping your house? How are you keeping your car? How are you keeping your electricity run, running in your house if you don't have no means of employment? So, bam, we shoot that, we shoot that pigeon up off that, off that power line also. Now then, we're going to shot two pigeons down off that power line, and we're going to move on to another pigeon. We're going to get to the origin of Sunday worship, actually. Now then, uh, this, this right here information that I'm fixing to read to you comes from the Converse Catechism of the Catholic Doctrine, the, second, the 12th edition. Also, some information also is going to be coming from the Encyclopedia Britannica online edition and uh, the Google Google online dictionary. So we're going to get into the origin of Sunday worship. The origin of Sunday being the day of rest. That's what we're going to get into right now. So in the Catholic Catechism, which actually is a book that the Catholics came up with designed to 
bring understanding and awareness to new converts into their religious belief and also to give understanding of their religious belief to people who are already Catholics. And this uh, catechism is posed in the form of a question and answer uh, format. And on page 50, it deals with the Sabbath. And the question is, what is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. So here it is. They're saying that Saturday is the Sabbath day. But then we go on to church on a Sunday. So that brings up another question, which they're going to ask and answer. It said, why do we question? Why do we deserve Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the church, the Catholic Church in the Council of Lacidia, Lacidia in AD 336 transformed the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So this is the Roman Catholics that says that reason why they worship or why they observe Sunday instead of Saturday is because the church, the Catholic church changed the worship on Saturday to Sunday. Now some of y'all might be saying, well what does that have to do with me? It has a lot to do with you if you're a Protestant. It has everything to do with you if you're a Protestant. And the reason and what that is is because when Martin Luther began to protest the abuses of the church, uh, the priests selling licenses for the indulgences and uh, campaigning against the infallibility of the Pope because, of, because the Catholics believe that the priests are the intermediates between man and God. See, when he started protesting that, which eventually began the Protestant Reformation movement, which became a, 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 another body from the Catholic Church, when they started that, when they started that Protestant movement, they just didn't come up with Sunday worship. He wasn't protesting Sunday worship or Saturday worship. They didn't just come up with that. That was in the 1500s. This right here, they've been they're saying that since that since 18, I mean AD 336, they've been worshiping on a Sunday. But before that, before that time. Before that time, they were worshiping on a Saturday. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But also, when King, when King uh, Henry VIII annulled all the power of the Pope over, over, over England and its subjects, simply because the Pope wouldn't allow him to have a divorce from this woman who he was with, who was not producing any male children, that he could have a male heir to the throne, when they separated, when the Church of England separated from the Church of Rome, they didn't just begin worshiping on a Sunday. They didn't separate because of doctoral issues and disagreements. Church of England separated from Rome, the Church of Rome because the Pope in Rome wouldn't give the King of England a divorce from his wife. But they kept this Sunday worship that came from that church. When John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, tried to reform, reform the Church of England in the 1700s and couldn't do it in England, he came to America and founded what was now be called the United Methodist Church. They didn't just begin worshiping on Sunday then. He brought along with them what he got from the Church of England, what he got from, from the Church of Rome. And when all these other different denominations came about, uh, who, which are direct descendants of the English colonists over here, None of them began worshiping on a Sunday right then. They, they just picking up the tradition from which they left off from their mother church in Rome. All these non-denominational groups that sprouted up in the late 70s and the 80s and now they now prolific all in the, in the 2000s. The leaders and, the, and the, uh, uh, founders of these different denominations just didn't begin worshiping on that Sunday. So when, it, when I'm telling you this about the cat, the origin of Sunday worship comes from this Catholic catechism. It's explaining it to them. That's why I'm speaking about the Catholics in there. But in a few minutes, I want to get to probably because see, when you ask the person who's a, who is in a, 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 a Protestant a Protestant denomination, why do you go to church on a Sunday? They're going to tell you because Jesus rose on the grave on a Sunday. That's also where they get that, what the Catholic Church says, also, but before they came up that conclusion, they said that they transferred this after 336 years after Christ. 33 popes 
I believe Pope Mark was this Pope right here in the Church of Lysidia. So after 30, uh, 30 some Pope, they finally come to the conclusion of something. But let's first, let's look at this. I don't even want to look at this Council of Lysidia. I want to, because that's, a no, that's one of a number of different councils that sprung up after this first council. Let's talk about this first council, which brought about a president established for all these other councils to come about. The first council of Nicaea, and this comes from the Encyclopedia of Canada Online and Wikipedia and uh, I believe uh, Google, Google uh, uh, Dictionary. It said the first council of Nicaea was a council of Christian bishops convened in the in the Bithynian, Bithynian city of Nicaea by the Roman Emperor Constantine in A.D. 325. So in A.D. 325, 11 years before the Council of Lycidia, they had the first Council of Nice. Let's find out what the first Council of Nice was commissioned to do. The, the ecumenical, the ecumenical, the ecumenical council was the first effort. The ecumenical council was the first effort to attain consensus in the church through an assembly representing all of Christendom. And we know from past lessons I did within all last month, all the month of June, go back and look at all those lessons. When they speak about Christendom, they're speaking about the European Roman Catholic Church. That's what they're speaking about. So, its main, its main accomplishments were settlements of Christological issues of the divine nature of God, the Son, and his relationship to God the Father. The construction of the first part of the Nicene Creed mandated uniform observance of the day of Easter and propagating of propagation of early canon law. So this, they established right here the day that they would celebrate Easter which was a pagan tradition. They came up with the conclusion that Easter will be observed on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. The first council of Nicaea was the first ecumenical council of the church. Most significant, it resulted in the first uniform Christian doctrine called the Nicaea Creed. With the creation of the creed, a president was established for subsequent local and regional councils of bishops to create statements of belief and canons of doctoral, doctoral orthodoxy. The intent being to define unity of beliefs. So let's stop right there for a second. Unity of the beliefs for the whole of Christendom. Let's stop right there for a second. So this was the first council. The Council of Nicaea, which is 11 years later, was the birth, was, was born from this right here. But this is very, it says right here, the intent being to define unity of beliefs. What beliefs? There's only one faith, one, let me see, man, let's, let's go to that, man. Uh, let's try Ephesians. Let me see if this is Ephesians. Oh, where was I at? I don't know. <laughs> let's try Ephesians real quick let me see uh, let me see let me see if it's in Ephesians yes Ephesians 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 4 and 4 we're going to start there when Paul brought this word to the Gentiles my last lesson I talked about how Paul was actually the teachers of the Gentile uh, it's entitled uh uh, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. When Paul brought this brought this word to the Gentiles, because before they had, before Paul brought this to them, they didn't have a God in the world. But it's verse four it says, "There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism." So, what are they talking about right here when it talks about to, the 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 intent of this first council was to define unity of beliefs. What beliefs? All these different belief systems 
that was inside the Roman uh, was inside the Roman Empire because Roman Empire was conquering so much land and so much territory in a quick space of time, but they were also allowing the conquered people of them lands to keep their culture, to keep their beliefs, and to keep their identity. So now you have a whole conglomerate of different religious belief systems being incorporated as one that's causing a bunch of confusion. So then they decided to come up with a means to bring about unity. The word Catholic, I'm look, we're going to show you what Catholic is. Oh yeah, I forgot also a book called Capitalism by Richard McBride, which was published in 1994 by Harper Collins, uh, defines the word capitalism, right? But we're going to read from the dictionary first. Catholic, Catholic means comprehensive, universal, broad in sympathies, taste, or interest, uh, including a wide variety of things, all embracing. An example, her tastes are pretty Catholic. Some of the synonyms uh, that goes with Catholic is the verse the first five, wide, broad, broad-based, elected, indiscriminate, open-minded, broad. Okay, and, and, and so that's what Catholic, Catholic is a whole, a universal. So when they brought this council together, they were bringing about a, a compiling all the relief systems within inside the empire up under one umbrella to bring about uniformity inside the empire. Therefore, that's where you come up with the word Roman Catholic. That's why you have all, if you have any understanding, any knowledge, and do any research, that's why you see in Roman Catholic and also in Protestant uh, Christianity, which is an uh, offspring, a descendant of Roman Catholic, you see all type of Northern European pagan symbolisms often there. Easter sunrise service is dealing with Estria and the returning of the Invictus Sun. You're seeing, you're seeing, you're seeing uh, the, the, the uh, December 25th, the birth of Jesus. What does it say he was born on December 25th in this Bible? They've been celebrating December 25th as the birth of the Invictus, uh, of Soul Invictus in other cultures. But to bring about a unity, to bring about a conformity with all, we're going to read that. We're going to bring about conformity with all the different religions. Our God is going to be born on this day for which your God was born on, according to you. That's how Jesus Christ became uh, 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 being taught by them that he was born on December the 25th. It's not written in this book nowhere. It's not written in this book anywhere where he rose from the grave on Easter. They've been celebrating a spring festival at the time of the spring equinox and to incorporate our religion with that, we're just going to take Jesus' resurrection and put it on with this. So now we have a conglomerate of a capitalism whole. So let's keep on reading. Another result of the council was an agreement on when to celebrate Easter, the most important feast of the ecclesiastical calendar decreed in a epistle to the Church of Alexander, in which it simply stated, We also send you good news of the settlement concerning the Holy Parsh, which is actually Passover. If you look up that word, P A S C H. That word is Passover. That word right there is the Greek word for Passover. That word right there is the word that they incorrectly translate into the New Testament is saying when they put Peter up and tending for Easter to pass over. No, it's Passover. Partial is Passover. There was no Easter. But anyway, it says, namely that in the answer of your prayers, this question also has been resolved. All the brethren in the East who have hitherto followed the Jewish practice, they've been following the teachings that came to them from Paul, will hitherto observe the custom of the Romans. 
So from now on, we're gonna do away with this Jewish, this Jewish teaching of of the Passover and begin to follow the customs of Rome. That's what this letter says that came. This is history. You can look it up in encyclopedia on your own to verify what I'm saying. This is history. This is what the Catholic Church did. So therefore, he said, and you and of yourselves and of all of us from the ancient times that have kept together with you past Easter. You ain't keep Easter because Paul did not teach him Easter. Now you might be saying that what does this have to do with saying we finna see? Historically significant as the first effort to attain consensus in the church through an assembly representing all of Christendom, the council was the first occasion where the technical aspect of Christology were discussed. Through it, a precedent was set for subsequent general council to adopt creeds and canons. This is the birth which led to the birth of the Council of Laodicea, which was like 11 years later. And in that council, 11 years later, is when they came up with the, with, with the conclusion that they're going to start where they moved the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. But I'm giving you a history of this council. So, the first council in Syria, the first general council in the history of of the church. This is the first council of the history of the church. But well, we know what church they're speaking of when they speak about the, They're not speaking about this right here is not talking about that church which they claim was born on Pentecost, which I dealt with. Go back and look at all the lessons I did last month uh, in June and May. We dealt extensively with that. This is not that church. This is the church of Rome, these Europeans, these Gentiles. So it says the first council of Nicaea, the first general council in the history of the church. That's why I had to put this down first to show you. We're not going to even deal with the council of Laodicea. But the council of Laodicea came about because of this stuff we're reading right here. So then it says was convened by the Roman Empire, Emperor Constantine the Great. But I want to show you something that occurred four years prior. So four years before this first council in Nicaea, 15 years before the, the council of Laodicea, for which they changed, the church changed, the Catholic church changed Saturday to Sunday, something occurred. On March 3rd, 321, Constantine I decreed that Sunday, Dia Solis, would be observed as the Roman day of rest. Now, Constantine was a sun worshiper. He was a part of the, the religion that believed in worshiping the sun. Now, this right here, well, let me keep on reading. On the venerable day of the sun, this is, this is the order that they have recorded in history. On the, on, the, on the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. In the country, who, in the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuit, because it often happens that another day is not suitable for grain sowing or vine planting, least by neglecting the proper moment for such operation, the bounty bounty of heaven should be lost. This is the first. This is the first recorded history. Of Sunday being a day of rest. This happened four years before the Council of Nicaea, 15 years before the, the uh, Council of Laodicea, for which they said that they changed the day of rest from seventh day to the first day. This is the first recorded history of Sunday being a day of rest. This was a civil law enacted by Constantine, the Emperor of Rome. This was the law of the land. This had nothing to do with Christianity. This had nothing to do with Christ allegedly being rose from the grave on a Sunday. This had everything to do with his worshiping of a pagan, a pagan God who is no God, which is the sun. And they set this day aside specifically for the honoring and the resting of that. 
That was the first, that's the history of the very first day, set, first time of Sunday being set aside as a day of rest. Now, let's get back to the catechism. So the question was, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? The answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the church council, the, church, the Catholic church in the council of later seated in AD 336 transformed the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Why did the Catholic church substitute Sunday for Saturday? This is a lie that they're fixing to tell, and I want to show you how it's a lie from the Word of God and from what we just got through reading. The answer, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Jesus, because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday. We finished, we're going to investigate that. And that the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. That's true. The Holy Ghost did descend on them on a Sunday because the Feast of the Weeks occurs 59 days after the first fruit were brought in. And that day always falls on a Sunday. But before I get into this right here, which also covers the Protestant, because the Protestant would tell you, well, we go to church on a Sunday because Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday. But we're going to see what the Word of God has to say about that. But this is what I want to bring to the attention before we do that. So you mean to tell me that after 300 years, after 30 some popes, Pope Mark would just sit around one day and say, well, hey, you know what? Call all these bishops together. You know what, man? I just got through reading the Bible, and it said that Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday. So therefore, we're going to have to stop worshiping on this Saturday and change worship on a Sunday. Is that what you mean to tell me? Is that the three-legged blind horse that you tell and sell me that's a Kentucky Derby contender? That all of a sudden, after 300 years, they... They just now realize, because it wasn't until this part, it says right here, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea in 336 transformed, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So before this event occurred in, three, in AD 336, they've been worshiping on a Saturday. And why did they change it? They saying they changed it. They substitute Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the grave on a Sunday. You just now discovering that? After 300 years? After 30 something popes? You just now coming to the conclusion that Christ rose on a Sunday? No, that ain't what happened. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna investigate that in a minute. But what happened was is that the law of the land was that everybody rests. On a Sunday, the first day of the week. But you've been taking that the seventh day of the week and resting. That's setting you apart from the rest of the land, from the rest of the people in the empire, because you're resting on the seventh day of the week. You're not doing any work on the seventh day of the week. According to the scriptures that Paul brought to you and in the churches that Paul established all over the European area, they were honoring the Sabbath according to the word of God. They working on a Sunday or doing whatever they want to do. There's a conflict coming about. And when that heat began to unfold on them after, after a time period of 15 years, they already started to, what they say about not following the customs of the Jews, it said right here, when they tell them about Easter, it said, from here on, you stop following the customs of the Jews and start preserving the customs of the, the traditions of the Romans. See this pressure beginning to unfold? Then finally, they busted that pipe, busted, and then we say, okay, well, okay, well, we're gonna just change our worshiping on Saturday to conform, because it says if they came about, it says right here to define unity of beliefs. So we're gonna change it to Sunday. That is how Sunday worship came about. That is how Sunday worship came. That is the origin of Sunday. No matter what you try to cover over it. To justify years down the road, this is the origin right here of Sunday worship. Don't take my word for it. Look it up yourself. It's an encyclopedia. But for all this technology we have, that's crazy. We have all this information we have. Right, We have the whole encyclopedia Britannica at our access on our computers. 
on our smartphone. We have the Library of Congress and all the information that they have. And we have all these books that will cover up thousands of houses. We have all this information within the fingertips. But nobody wants to use it. We want to spend all our time on TikTok and, and, and Instagram and twerking and doing all other type of stuff to get laughs and ha-has and kids. I mean, there's time for that. There's time not to do that. This information is readily available. But let's move on. The Catholics say that they moved Sunday, uh, move, 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 transferred uh, the worship on Saturday to Sunday in AD 336. Then they claim that it's because Jesus rose from the grave. But, 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 so you're telling me none of them other popes before Pope Mark knew anything about this. None of them popes before him realized this. It took 300 years for them to actually realize that Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday. We fit to see that. Because we got the same Bible. We got the same Bible today. So let's see this. That bird finna get shot up off that pole right now. Let's go to, uh-oh, I lost my way. Let's go to Matthew 28. We're going to see about Jesus raised from the grave on a Sunday. And that is the reason why people say that they worship on a Sunday. Matthew 28, <coughs> excuse me. So I got all day today. I got all day. Matthew 28. And pick it up at verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So we're going to skip on down. So it's the first day of the week, or it's dawning towards the first day of the week. They come into the sepulcher. Well, then let's read on down to that. Verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where he, the Lord lay. So, early in the morning, on the first day of the week, we're going to look at this as witness reports, as incident statements. See, a, a, a crime has been committed. People are giving their official report as far as what they've seen happen. And we're fixing to do like Joe Friday and review the facts as stated by the witnesses. So it's the first day of the week, dawning towards the first day of the week. And we're going to get a little bit more clarity on it because we're going to go through all four Gospels so there won't be no room, no margin of error, nothing. So the first day of the week, which is when the Sabbath is in, in the end of the Sabbath, as it dawned, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary that came to the sepulcher. So they come into this sepulcher at the first day of the week. When they get there, they find this angel there. And the angel is telling them, be not afraid of him because you're seeking Jesus. But he's not here. He is risen. When did he rise? He rose before they got there. And when did they get there? They got there early Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Then they told him, come in there and see where he lay. He's not here. Let's go to Mark. Mark will give us a little bit more clarity. We're going through all of them. <clears throat> Let's go to Mark 16. <clears throat> Mark 16. And pick it up at verse 1. <clears throat> and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Megaline and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rise of the sun. Now, when you talk about very early in the morning, see, very early in the morning, the first day of the week, once you get 
Once you go beyond very early in the morning, you stepping into very late. When you when you stepping into when you go beyond very early in the morning on the first day of the week, you stepping into very late in the e and very late at night of the seventh day of the week. See what I'm saying? So it's no more, you can't go no farther back than very early in the morning. Once you go beyond very early in the morning, you are very late at night. So very early in the morning, there's nowhere else to go but stores this on the first day of the week at the rising of the sun. Verse 3. And they said amongst themselves, who should roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away. So when they got here very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, before the rising of the sun, they find the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were afraid. <laughs> and he said unto them, Be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where he, he, they lay. So they go to the sepulcher early in the morning on the first day of the week, and they find out that Jesus is no longer there. Let's skip on down to verse 9. I'm going to show you something. We're going to learn several things on this verse right here. The first thing we're going to learn is that we have to understand the importance of punctuation in the English language because people will use certain things like it said when we talk about uh, uh, Jesus said that, that the people in heaven right now and they use the use the, the verse where Jesus told the thief on the cross today I say to you you'll be in heaven with me uh, this day I say to you you'll be in heaven with me but depending where you put your comma you'll get a different understanding either he's saying today you're going to be in heaven with me which we know that Jesus didn't go to heaven that day well, Jesus was in the grave at least three days and three nights. And then after that, he was he was seen on he was on earth for another 40 days. So what the thief was in heaven by himself, him and him and the father? No. But when you put the comma in the right space, it's saying today. I say to you today, on July the 4th, I'm telling you that today you'll be with me in heaven. Well, this is another example. When we're gonna read it first, as it's the punctuation mark is in, and then I'm going to explain to you where the punctuation should be, and then we're going to go and verify that that is correct. Verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, so based on that, comma, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, comma, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, comma, out of whom he had cast the seven devils. So based upon this reading, we get an understanding that Jesus rose early the first day of the week, because it said, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, comma, but that comma right there at the week is not supposed to be there. That comma is supposed to be after risen. Then you put that comma after risen, then this is what you got. Now when Jesus was risen, comma, early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom is that? And that's true. She was the first person to see him after he rose from the grave. And we're going to see that right now. But Mark and Luke, I mean, uh, uh, Matthew and Mark have already showed that on the first day of the week when the women got there, Jesus wasn't there. He was already gone. So let's go to John real quick. Let's go to John 20, I believe. Yeah, John 20. Thank you. John 20. John 20, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. The first day of the week came Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. It was still, like, it's dark. She's coming early to the sepulchre. They say the first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and see if the stones moved away. So when she seen the stones move away, what had happened? Then she run up and come to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. So she's telling them, hey man, Jesus ain't in this tomb no more. And this, 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 this testimony occurred very early in the morning on the first day of the week. So that means that Jesus had already been gone. So let's see what happens. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. 
So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooped down and looking in and saw the linen and the clothes yet would not in. Then came Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see if the linen clothes line. So they look in the sepulcher early in the morning on the first day of the week and they don't find Jesus, right? So, uh, excuse me, let's skip on down to verse 11. Now, after they see that, they burn off, the disciples burn off and go on, but Mary, she's still sitting there. So verse 11 says, but Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. She's looking in there still early in the morning, looking at where Jesus' body had been. And they said unto her, verse 13, Woman, why is thou, why weepest thou? She said, uh, she said unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. What do you mean they're taking away his Lord? So she came to this, it says, right, verse 1, the first day of the week come Mary Magdalene early in the morning when it was yet dark. When she gets there, she discovers that Jesus' body has already been removed. But she's thinking that somebody came and stole it. But either way it go, he's not there. And what did the angels tell him? He is risen. And, be, and very early, like I said, be, be, once you get past very early on the first day, you into very late on the seventh day. So let's keep on reading. And when she, and when she had said thus, she turned herself and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seek thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou had borne him hence, tell me where thou, thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. So she's still thinking that somebody came and took Jesus away. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week. And Jesus said unto Mary, she, and Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned around, turned herself, and said unto him, Rebbenah, which is the same matter. This is what the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection. This is what Matthew, I mean, Mark 16 and 9 was referring to when it said that in, uh, when Jesus rose from, when Jesus had risen, man, let me go, because I do not like doing that. Y'all know I don't like doing it. So let's go back to 16. I like, like make, if I don't know it verbatim, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to speak the word of God and then not know what I'm saying. So I'm going to let the word of God speak. It said, verse 9, Matthew 16 and 9 says, Now when Jesus was risen, early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. This is when he's appearing to Mary, Mary Magdalene, early on the first day of the week. He had already risen. He had already risen. Let's go, let's go to one more place in there. Let's go to Luke 24. We just we just shooting this bird off the tree. Don't tell you don't. When you put it up against, they say try the spirit by the spirit. I'm trying their words by the words of God, and we're seeing what's happening. Matt, I mean Luke 24. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, like I said, it's no more beyond bed. We get past very early in the morning, you're very late at night. It's one of the two. Either you're very late at night, or you're very early in the morning. Now. Upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord. So that means very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, when they entered into that sepulchre, and they did not find Jesus' body, that means he had already risen. Let's keep on reading. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed there, there, there about. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they sat, as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. And they being told this very early in the morning. 
of the first day of the week. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you, to you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Let's put our feet, let's put our marker right here. We're going to go back, and we're going to go back and look at it. It said that Jesus was telling them that on the third day he's going to rise from the, he's going to be killed and rise from the, uh, again on the third day. So let's put a marker right here. And let's run this down real quick. Let's go to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, and we're going to pick it up at 22. Matthew 17 and 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were very sick. So Jesus is telling them right here, hey man, I'm going to get killed by these people. And on the third day, after you put me in this grave, I'm going to come up out of here. Okay, let's let's look into this some more. Let's go to Mark 8. I like showing multiple multiple areas. So, so like I said, in the court of law, this is what you would call the preponderance of evidence. Irrefutable evidence. Give you a whole bunch of stuff to, to digest when you deliberate and come back with your with your Verdict. Let's go to Mark 8. Mark 8, excuse me, and 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So he's steadily telling them this. Let's go to Mark 10. There's another place, there's another, see, as Jesus is going on and he's speaking to different people and the disciples, he's still telling the disciples events that's going to occur. He's preparing their mind for this. Let's go to uh, Matthew 10, I'm excuse me, Mark 10 and 32. Mark 10 and 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem and Jesus went before them and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And the Gentiles deliver him, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and, scor and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. So there it goes. He's teaching this. And his teaching is so prevalent that he's reached the third day that even the Pharisees who want to kill him understand that he said that he's going to rise on the third day. Let's see what they did. Let's go to Matthew 27 real quick. Matthew 27. This, this is something that the Pharisees which killed Jesus did the day after they killed him. Let's go to Matthew 27 and 62. Matthew 27 and 62. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise. So even they knew that Jesus said that he would rise. But where did they get this from? Let's go to Matthew 12. Let's go to Matthew 12 and find out where they get this from, the significance of it. Matthews 12, Matthews 12 and 38. If I'm moving too fast for you, because I got a lot of material I want to get through. And as we say in the Israel, God, bring your paper, pen, and patience. If you move too fast, just take notes, go back and look at it yourself, or it's on it's online, and you can, it's going to be recorded and you watch it later on. But when I get crunk in this word of God, I'll be running. But anyway, Matthews 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we will see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So this is where they get that from. So now, we had a marker right there. Let's go back to Luke 24. Now we see the significance of verse 7. 
but we're gonna read down to it. Verse, read down to it. Everybody knew and understood because Jesus repeatedly told him at different parts of time that he's gonna be taken to Jerusalem, he's gonna be killed, and he's gonna rise from the grave in three days. Now, 24 and 1, Luke 24 and 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone, they found a stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of Jesus. Why didn't they find the body of Jesus? Because he had already resurrected. He had already risen. How do we know this? Let's keep on reading. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their face to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living amongst the dead? So why y'all seeking somebody who's alive in a tomb with nothing but dead people? That's what he asked him. So that means Jesus had to have been alive. And when was this? Very early on the first day of the week. Verse 6, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So if Jesus already rose, and they come in and be informed that he said he was going to rise in three days, then that means that the time that they being told this information had to be with after the third day. So therefore, the Jesus could not have rose on a Sunday as they claimed. So therefore, getting back to this law that the Catholic Church is putting out there, talking about well, the reason why. Well, let me let me read it. Let me read it to you. In the Catholic Catechism, it says, "I'm gonna start from the top." It says, "Which is the Sabbath day?" Answer: Saturday is the Sabbath day. They acknowledge that Saturday is the Sabbath day. Okay. With Saturday is the Sabbath day, here's the next question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea in A.D. 336 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So because of the authority the church think that they possess, they in 336 years after Christ, they changed the worship from Saturday to Sunday. So that means that 33, 30, 336 years before this incident, 33 popes before this incident, you can look all this up yourself. Pope Mark was the pope at that time, and he was the 33rd pope going back to Peter, and Peter was not the pope, but that's another story, and you can look at that lesson I did two weeks ago. But I'm just going to give him that for the sake of argument so the conversation could continue. But... They're saying after 336 years, they've been worshiping on a Saturday. They've been worshiping on a Saturday. They've been honored in the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week. That's what they're saying right here. So then here's the next question. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? Here's where the law come in. The Catholic, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Jesus rose. Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday. We see that's a lie according to the word of God, and we know it's a lie because the law of the land dictated 14 years before you decided to make that official dictate that the law of the land in Rome, according to Constantine, will be that on Sunday will be the day of rest. It had nothing to do with Christianity and everything to do with Constantine being a sun worshiper. We read, I'm going to read that again. If you can look it up, you can go ahead and look that up in the Encyclopedia of Brief Canada. It said on March the third, on March the third, three hundred and twenty-one, Constantine the first decreed that Sunday, Dia Solis, will be observed as the Roman day of rest. On the vulnerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and the people reside in the cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. That right there is the first recorded evidence of Sunday being a day set aside for rest. That was fourteen years. Prior to this incident right here at the Church of Laodicea, but the only reason why the church, that, that these people right here decided to make Sunday the day of worship instead of Saturday, which they've been doing for the last 300 years, according to what they were taught by Paul, because that keep was coming on to them from the Roman authorities. So, 
That bird right there, for all those who believe that the reason why they worship on a Sunday is because Christ rose from the grave on a Sunday, that bird been popped up and fell down up the tree, and now it's standing in the tall grass, sticking up the land. Let's move on. Now, other people will tell us that, well, the reason we worship on Sunday is because Paul moved the day of worship from Sunday, I mean from Saturday to Sunday. Well, in order, in order for that lie to stand, then you got to ask, well, why did Paul move the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday? Well, he moves, he moves from Saturday to Sunday because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. But well, we see that Jesus didn't rise on the grave from, on Sunday. So if we see that Jesus, and we prove that Jesus didn't rise on the, from the grave on a Sunday, then there was no reason for Paul to change the day from Saturday to Sunday as they claim. But we're going to go look at the verses, the two verses. They give two scriptures. We're going to look at those two scriptures and analyze those two scriptures and see what those scriptures are actually talking about. The first scripture that they use is Acts 20. Acts 20 and 7. This, this scripture right here is their go-to scripture to say that Paul changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Acts 20. I need to get a different marker, but it's, it's going to really irritate me. Acts 20. Acts 20 and 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. See there? See, that means that Paul changed the Sabbath to the first day of the week. That's what they say. I didn't read that. Did you read that? Let's read that again. I mean, I, like, let's read that again. I'm not, I'm not sharp, but I do have a little bit of reading comprehension skills. Let's read that again. And on, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the disciples came together, why did the disciples come together at that particular time? To break bread. And what does that mean to break bread? To simply eat. What did Peter do? I mean, what did Paul do? Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue his speech until midnight. Let's go to Acts 20 and verse 1, and we're going to read down into this. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called upon him, the disciples, and embraced them, and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, what is exhortation? Preaching the word of God. He came into Greece, and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia, and there accompany him into Asia, Sapater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarch, Aristarchus, and Sicunus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus of Asia, and Tychius of Tromus. These going before tarried for us at Trias, and we sailed from Philipp Philipp Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Taurus in five days, where we abode seven days. So Paul was doing a bunch of traveling. That's what's going on. He's doing a bunch of traveling, going back and forth to these different churches that he established through, through the word of God to these Gentiles. So now let's keep on, let's, let's continue to see what's going on. Now we're getting into this verse. So then it says, and on the, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, when they came together on the Sunday to break bread, Sunday ain't the only time that they broke bread. Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. But now, let's skip on down to 13. And he went before to his ship and sailed up to Assur were intended to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, binding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Matilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over to Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trigalium. 
And the next day we came to Miletius. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hastened if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So this is Paul on a travel. He's traveling. And he took advantage of the last day he was going to be with these disciples when they all came together and started eating on this particular time. And then he began to preach the word of God. But what these people have done who believe that this verse means that Paul changed the Sabbath from the, first, from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week are making it synonymous as breaking bread, preaching. When they broke bread, Paul preached. That means that the Sabbath has been changed to the first day of the week. That's that logic. Okay, we're going to follow that logic. We're going to use that. We're not going to cherry pick this. We're going to take that same logic and apply it to something else that Paul did. If you're saying that because Paul and the disciples broke bread and Paul preached to them on the first day of the week, then that means that Paul changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. We're going to see, use that same logic to check something out. And it doesn't matter when you decide to start your day. We could do it according to the Bible, where at the end of the one day, like when today ends, like today ends on uh, at nighttime, the 4th, according to the Bible, it will begin, Wednesday will begin, and Wednesday night will actually be what we call Tuesday night. Or if you decide to use the time frame that we use today, where at 12 o'clock midnight, which is the middle of the night, it's a new day. Either way you want to do what Either way, you can start the day at the, end, at the beginning of the night or you can start the day in the middle of the night. It don't matter. But the same logic that you apply for saying that on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow, means that he changed the Sabbath from the, first, uh, from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. We're going to apply that same logic. This is our criteria and our standard. We're going to apply. Let's keep on reading. Verse 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. So now it's dark time. So if you want to follow the biblical, whether, whether you follow the biblical standards or you follow today's man standards, we're no longer in the first day of the week. We're no longer in the first day of the week. The sun went down. According to the Bible, we're now in the second day of the week. According to man, the day begins in the, in the, in the middle of the night. Now we're in the second day of the week. And don't say, oh, wait, no, 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 none of that. Because you know, on Thursday night at 11.59, you're looking on your phone, checking your bank account to see if your money hit in the next minute when it comes to be 12 o'clock midnight Friday night. At all aspects of our life and all our electronic devices, at 12 o'clock midnight in the middle of the night begins the next day. So the next, So we're no longer right here. On the first day of the week, we on the second day of the week. And based on that logic that you used, that Paul broke bread and preached, was the reason why you say that he changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. We're going to apply that same logic right here to the second day of the week. Let's see what happens. Verse 8, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain young man named Etychus. Being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching, he sunk from the sunk was he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft. So he on the third floor and was taken up there. And they thought he was dead because he fell out the ground. He fell out the window. And check it out. Paul went down and embraced and Paul went down and fell upon him, embracing him, said. Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. So after Paul did all this, on the second day of the week, on the second day of the week, let's see what he did. When he had therefore came up again, he came back upstairs. What did he do? He said, when he, when he therefore came up again and had broke bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of dawn, so he departed. So what at? After midnight, when we're in the second day of the week, after the sun went down, when we're definitely according to the Bible in the second day of the week, Paul went back upstairs after saying that this young man is still alive. He broke bread again and he began to preach. So therefore, using your logic that you applied to saying that Paul changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week because he broke bread with the disciples and preached to them, 
then that means that the seventh day of the week had been moved from the first day of the week to the second day of the week. That's according to your logic. We can't cherry pick this. If you apply that logic and that nonsense to justify your belief that Paul changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week, that same logic has to be applied for the same situation and the same aspect, the same things that he did. So therefore, the seventh day is not on the first day of the week, but it's on the second day of the week, according to you. See how stupid you sound? When you start applying with the word of God, it said, what does it say? It said, be loved. Believe not every... Let me read that. Let me read that. I'm going to go... You can keep your finger right there. Well, we finished with that. And I'm just throwing a side note up in here. First John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. And we know that this spirit in this aspect is talking about words. Believe not everything that anybody's saying, even if I'm telling you it. Don't believe it just on face value. But try the spirits. Try what spirit? These words are being spoken, whether they are of God. How are you to try whether they are of God? You're supposed to read this book. That's why I said study to show thyself approved. You have to study this word of God and when somebody comes to you with it, you're supposed to try the spirits by the spirit. And why does God say you have to do this? Because many of false prophets have gone out into the world. You see what happens when you start taking what they say, mix it up, and try it. It's just, it's just like when you start shaking up like in the dope game. I know some of y'all might be offended, but I'm just saying, I'm speaking for something I know about. In the dope game, you got people out there who in the game, when they get some, when they get some hard, they take some shake off of it, put it in a little vial, mix with some chemicals, and shake it up. And, de and depending on the color of the uh, 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 substance, if it's a darker color, that means you got some quality dope. If it's a lighter color, that means you got some trash, right? So it's the same thing. That 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 the catalyst inside the chemical inside that vial is the catalyst which allows you to determine whether you got some good or some bad. It's this Bible that determines the criteria, the standards for right or wrong. We're going to take the words that they speak and apply it to what the word of God. And if it comes up to be what well, uh, yeah, well, God did say this, then that's what it is. Because it says in Thessalonians, we prove all things. And how we prove it by the word of God. And we hold on to that which is right. So we're going to take their words, apply it to what the word of God, and see what happens. And you see what happens? It's nonsense talking about Paul according to, according to them. Acts 20 and 7, Paul changed the Sabbath to the first day of the week. No, he, okay, if he did that, then he changed it to the second day of the week. Pure nonsense. So that bird, bam, we shooting that bird out the tree. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, the next go to verse, 1 Corinthians, to justify their belief that Sunday is the, uh, 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 the new Sabbath. 1 Corinthians. Sixteen, 1 Corinthians 16 and pick it up too. 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. Upon the first day of the week, let, and here we go. And do you realize, you know, this phrase on the first day of the week is only mentioned eight times in the Bible. And we don't read each time it was mentioned in the Bible. And now one of them has anything to do with Jesus rising from the grave. The only thing that the first day of the week has to do with Jesus rising from the grave is that that is when the women discovered that he rose from the grave. I'll give you an example. Today is the 4th of July. Yesterday, let's say if I got off work yesterday at 4.30, but the banks decided to close early in observance for the 4th of July holiday. So the banks going to close at 12 o'clock, 12 p.m. Uh, yesterday. I get off work. I want to go to the bank. Get some money so I can spend some money on the 4th of July. I get off work at 4.30. I know the bank usually closes at 6. But when I get to the bank, it's closed. When I get to the bank and I discover that it's closed, does it mean that the bank just closed at 4.30? No. It means that the bank, it means that I discovered that the bank been closed, but the bank closed at 12 o'clock. It's just that I'm just now coming into the knowledge that the bank had closed. At 4.30 is when I came into this knowledge. It's the same thing with Jesus on the first day of the week. I, the only thing the first day of the week has to do with Jesus is that that is when the women discovered 
that he had rose from the grave. And it wasn't until the next, it wasn't because, because they didn't even believe that Jesus rose from the grave when she told them that. It wasn't until later on, you read that story, it wasn't until later on when the sun went down and then in another week, which is the second day of the week, where the rest of the disciples are inside the house, they discovered that Jesus rose from the grave because he popped up in front of that room in front of them. And then as far as Thomas, it wasn't until eight days after that. That he discovered, he said, man, I ain't going to believe him. Okay, y'all say he wrote, I ain't going to believe him until I see the, the, uh, the, the hole in his hands and on his side. So then eight days after that, that's when Jesus popped up in that room again and showed himself to Thomas. So what are you talking? The only thing that they did, so, so where are we going to take this at? We're going to take it from Thomas' perspective? We're going to take it from the disciples' perspective who discovered that they actually now know that Jesus rose from the grave. They know his body ain't there. But they didn't, they found that out on a Sunday. He'd been gone. So when they talk about the first day of the week, they ought to make, they don't have nothing to do with Jesus' resurrection. So they can't even use this right here, but they still do. So it says, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered for him. That there be no gathering when I come. See, that means that the first day, that means that he moved the seventh day from the seventh to the first day. Where, where did you get this from? You have to show me your line of logic. Because when we read the word of God without any preconceived notion, without any denominational uh, 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 dictates in our mind, we cannot come to any conclusion about what well, this means. It says, upon the first day of the week, let every man, every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there will be no gathering when I come. Don't say nothing about Jesus. It don't say nothing about Jesus rising from the grave. It says on the first day of the week, let people gather their stuff together. So there won't be no collections when I come. But let's find out where he put this in context. Let's put this in context. Let's go to verse 1. 1 Corinthians 16 and 1, and we're going to put this in context to see what it's actually talking about. Now, concerning the collections of the saints, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye. So he's given orders to do something. He's writing letters telling these churches to do a particular thing. They're collecting money for some saints. Now we're going to read verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him that there will be no gathering when I come. So, so Paul is, 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 is fixing to do some collecting. He's fixing to do some traveling for the saints. But what's going on? Let's look at this. Let's find out why. Let's go to Acts 11. Let's go to Acts 11 real quick. Keep, keep your marker right here because we're coming right back. Acts 11. We're going to find out why Paul is telling them about doing some collection for the saints. Who are these saints? Where are they at? And why do they need some type of collections? He's talking about resources, right? Acts 11, verse 27. Acts 11, verse 27. Give me a second. Acts 11, verse 27. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dark throughout all the land, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brothers which were in Jerusalem, which also they did and sent to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and so So there's fixing to be some hardship in the land. And if you remember, on the day that the Pentecost, what they call Pentecost, occurred, they and, and the little church, the so-called new church started growing, everybody started selling their prop. Man, let's see if I can go, man, if I could go get this real quick, that'll be a blessing. Keep, 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 keep it. No, we could go better. Let's go to Acts 2. Let's see if I can find this real quick. Uh, no, it's probably Acts 3. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Okay, X4. So, all the believers to a dwelling in Jerusalem after the time that the after the time that the Holy Ghost descended on them and, and they began to uh, formulate this community, right? They began to formulate this community. Anyway, let me just go on to verse 4. And it says, uh, uh, Acts 4, 30, 32. And the multitude of them believed were in one heart and of one soul. Neither said of any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and the, the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Neither was there any amongst them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of these things that were sold. So all these people, they sell their land and their property to get money to help out the young community that's growing up out of out of out, out of this new church that they call. So we could go back to 1 Corinthians 16. So this so this right here is the saints, and because there was a famine fixing to occur, there was some, some hardship occurring, and they Paul and them are sending messengers. And letters to all these different churches about gathering these resources. It's like a like a relief agency, a relief drive, such as when a hurricane comes through or natural disaster occurs, as far as a tornado or earthquakes or typhoons or anything. And the communities wiped out, fires. You have all these different people in the different church organizations and groups organizing a whole bunch of uh, relief equipment and material to send to these people who've been affected by this particular thing. That's what's happening here because it said, I man, where was that? Acts 11. I know I should have kept my finger up somewhere. Acts 11, Acts 11 and 29. It said, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brothers which dwelt in Judea. They're sending relief. But now, Paul has already sent letters to the churches in the Galatians, and he's telling them what he told. He's telling these Corinthians the same thing he told these Galatians. He said in verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has possessed, prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So he's saying, say, man, by the time I get here to pick up these funds and these relief uh, of material and take it to Judea for the brothers who are in need, Everything should already be organized. All I need to do is pick up the person who y'all have uh, authorized to travel with me. And that's what he says in verse 3. Let's read that. He said, and when I, when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liber, 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 liberty unto Jerusalem. So whoever y'all got coming with me, man, have everything ready. But when you do that, there is so much work involved in doing that. When If you haven't been involved in a relief drive or even just a clothing drive, the amount of stuff that's you, the, the effort is required to go into it constitute work. The Sabbath day is a day of rest. The Sabbath day is a day of rest. So once the Sabbath is finished, once the Sabbath is completed, that very next day, the first day that we're eligible to work, gather all this stuff together, organize it, and have it ready for me when I get there. That's what this verse is talking about. It's not talking about him moving the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Bam! That other bird done got shot off that tree. Let's, let's move on. Now you got people. Now you have people. We're going to deal with people who said that the Sabbath is done away with. It's been nailed to the cross. Jesus did, did, uh, did away with the Sabbath. And they go to verse. We're going to analyze that and look over it. And find out whether what they're saying is true based upon the verse that they put on the table as evidence. See, I'm just cross-examining everything that they put on the table today. So let's go to Colossians. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. This is their go-to verse right here for those who believe that the Sabbath has been done away with. Colossians 2 and verse 16. Colossians 2 and verse 16. 
It says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or in the new moon or of the Sabbath. See, that right there shows you that the Sabbath is done away with. We don't have to keep them Sabbath. Because he said, don't let nobody judge you. Hold up. <laughs> Hold up. Let's, let's not jump the gun. Let's go to Colossians 1 and 1. First. Colossians 1 and 1. First. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brothers, to the saints and the faithful brothers in, in Christ, which are at Calais, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ. This is a letter that Paul's writing. He's telling you who he's writing this letter to. He's writing this letter to the saints and faithful brothers in the Christ, in, 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 in Christ which are in Calais. He's not talking to everybody in Calais. He's not talking to every single individual in Calais. He's only talking to those who believe. Now, we're going to analyze this. He said, let no man judge you in me. See, what has occurred and what was happening was that once that word of God came to these people, these Colossians, that word of God sanctified them. What it means by sanctified means set them apart. Why are they set apart? Because now they are no longer doing the things that they used to do. They're no longer eating certain type of foods. That's why I said, let nobody judge you in meats. What is they talking about? Paul gave them the dietary law about eating pork, pigs, shrimps, catfish, and all the other things that the Lord said in the Bible in, in, in Leviticus. Paul gave it to them. And now as a result, these people are beginning to follow these laws. So what is happening is what is happening now. Oh, man, you've been eating pork. Man, you grew up eating pig. Pickle pig, pig, and, and, and intestines, and what is it, like, hog head cheese, and, uh, and, and come on, you've been eating all that. Why all of a sudden now, after, they, after them Hebrews, the Israelites came up, see, you in the cult, you letting them people mislead you, bro. You need, come on, man. That's what he's talking about. Or, 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 or or judge you in drinks, and, and that's dealing with the dietary law. Or in respect of a holiday. Holy day. What holy day? The, the seven feast days of the Lord. The, the feast of unleavened bread, first and second, uh, the first day feast of unleavened bread, the seventh day feast of unleavened bread, the Pentecost, which is the feast of weeks, the memorial blowing of the trumpet, the, uh, 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 the day of atonement, the first day of tabernacle, and the eighth day. They're keeping that now. Man, what do you mean you keeping the feast of unleavened bread, bro? What do you mean you keeping this? Man, you need, man, you need to stop that. You ain't busy. You know what I'm saying? You be changing up too much. Let these dudes come. These out-of-towners come from wherever they came from. Put the stuff in your ear. And now you got you sitting up here talking about you ain't going to do this because you because today is the day. Man, come on, man. You know you've been getting with this. Come on, let's do this. That's what he's talking about. Or, 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 or of the new moon. What do you mean of a new moon? The new moon is the means of calculating time according to God. What do you mean? Is you, you, what do you mean? Today is now. This is this month. You're going according, man. We're going according to this calendar. You're going according to that Hebrew calendar. See, man, you letting them dudes come up in here with that chitter chatter, getting up in your ear, telling y'all this and that. Man, if you don't do that, you can move around. That's what he's talking about. People are judging them because they're doing this stuff. Or of the seven days. And it is over the seven days. Man, what do you mean you ain't going to do no work today? What do you mean you ain't going to go out there and ball with me today? Man, come on, man, you keep the set. Man, the set, man, what are you talking about? But here's the thing. That's what that's, that's what that's talking about. These believers are being, being ridiculed and criticized and harassed by people who don't believe. But here's the thing. How did these people know anything about dietary laws of God? How did they know anything about the holy day, feast days of the God. How did they know anything about keeping track according to the new moon of God? And how did they know anything about the Sabbath of God? Let's go see. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians uh, 2. Let's go to Ephesians 2. Ah, keep a marker there. Keep a marker there. Keep a marker in... Uh, Colossians 1, but it ain't like, I mean, even if it done, it ain't like Colossians going to move around and appear somewhere in the Old Testament. You, when I call it, you know where it's at. <laughs> so Ephesians 2, 
And we're going to pick it up at Eleven, Ephesians 2 and 11. This is Paul speaking to the Ephesians. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by him. That at that time, what time he talking about? In time past. Before I came to you, before I gave you this word of the true and living God, in times past, you were without Christ. You didn't have Christ in your life because you didn't know Christ. No one had ever came to you speaking the word of the true and living God. So in that time, you were being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And being an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, what happened? And strangers from the covenants of promise. What covenants of promise? God made this promises. His, do I have that in here? No, I don't, but I know where it's at. Put a marker right here. We're going to look at what promises we're talking about because everybody, I'm going to do a lesson on that Lord willing one day. Uh, am I in Romans or Hebrews? Everybody talking about the new covenant, the new covenant, the new covenant this, the new covenant that. We're going to find out what the new covenant is. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. We're going to pick it up at verse 8. For finding fault with them who is them? The children of Israel. Because what he's fitting to do is fitting to quote Jeremiah 31, 31. And we'll go there in a second just to show you that uh, uh, Paul is quoting that. But he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. What is this new covenant that he, did I, that he said he's going to make? Let's see. Not according to the covenant that I made with their father in the day when I took them by hand to the, lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continue not in my covenant and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I shall be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So this new covenant was given to Israel. It was Israel or, or only. And we're going to read that, I think, that the Lord spoke to. This is the same covenant that Jesus said, drink on, the, on, the, on Passover on the day that they call uh, uh, the Lord's Supper. This is actually the Passover. He said, drink. This is my blood for the remission of sins. This is for the new covenant. This is the new covenant that he made with Israel. And I always use an analogy of a union and a company. You cannot enjoy the benefits that this union has with this company if you are not a part of this union. If you want to enjoy the benefits that those members of that union is acquiring by, by an agreement that they have with that company, then you must become a member of that union. It's the same way right here. If you want to enjoy the benefits of the promises of the covenant that the Lord gave to Israel and Israel only for the world, then you must be a, car, a part of Israel. That's why it says right here in Ephesians 2 and 12 that at that time you were without Christ. Before Paul came to them, they didn't know nothing about Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and having no hope, what is this hope? The hope of salvation, the hope that they past sins will be forgiven of them and they have a clean slate to reach because until that point in time they're heading straight to hell every man is born is born in sin sin is the transgression of the law and what is what is the ways of sin death and until Jesus came and, 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 and shed his blood for our remission of sin all of us were on hell this way y'all were on the way to hell till I came to you with this word of God and now that you accepted God, now you accepted God, accepted this word, the true and living God, accepted this word, accepted this ordinance, now you, you're keeping the dietary law, you're keeping the feast days, you're keeping the Sabbath, now people are beginning to judge you. That was that. Don't let no man judge you on that. God is your judge. But he says, I'm going to start, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, aliens, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and with a, without a God in the world. 
So before Paul came to these people, they had no hope at all. Let's go to Amos 3 real quick. I haven't hit the Old Testament in a minute. Let's go to Amos 3. No, 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 no. Nope. Acts 17. Sorry about that. Acts 17. Show you something else. Yeah. Acts 17 started at verse 16. And I'm going to skip around. I'm going to skip that. Uh, uh, uh. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So this city of Athens was completely into idolatry, right? Let's go to verse 22. Let's find out. No, well, I can read down into this. I can read down into this. Yeah, I'm going to read down into it. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons in the marketplace daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, others, some, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So he's telling these people about Jesus and the resurrection. But they don't know nothing about this. This is strange to them. They're calling him a babbler. What's he talking about? They ain't never heard this yet. And it wasn't until Paul stepped on the scene and started telling them this that they began to know anything. But let's keep on. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherefore thou speak. What is this you talking about? Come here, man. Let's take you to this, to this place and let's talk about what you're talking about. Explain this to us. This is the first time that these Athens are hearing anything about Jesus Christ rising from the grave three days later. For, for the remission of your sins. Before that time, they did not know that they had no God in the world. Before that time, they knew nothing about the Sabbath day because the Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord, of God. And he's a God to everybody. But he gave it to Israel to pass that word out to everybody else. But they didn't even know him. We're going to show you that right now. And verse 20, for thou bring certain strange things to our ear. This is strange. I ain't never heard this. This is strange. I ain't never heard nothing about no man dying and rising three days later. For, for sin? What sin? What is sin? Sin is transgressing the law. Whose law? God's law. What God? There's thousands of God in here. No, the one true only. I'm finna show you what God I'm talking about. I ain't talking about uh, Zeus and Mercury and Apollos and, and, and all these other uh, cappuccinos and all this God. I'm finna show you who I'm talking about. So, he said, Verse 20, for thou bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all for all the Athens and strangers which were there spent their time and nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I, as I passed by and I beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him I declare unto you. This is who I'm going to tell you about. This unknown God who you worship and ignorantly don't know nothing about. He's the one I'm told you about who rose from the grave three days later for the remission of your sin. He's the one I'm telling you about whose law, if you could break his law, then you are committing sin. He is the true and living God. Not this stuff that you don't build up on your vain imagination. But before Paul said any of that, they knew none of it. Let's go on back, man. I'm so crunk now. Woo, thank you. Let's go to Amos 3. Let's go to Amos 3. Then we're going to jump back. We're going to jump back. We're gonna, I'm just laying foundation, man. I'm going to make sure my foundation is sure. I make sure my foundation, because if anybody want to refute, they're going to refute the word of God. Because I ain't interpreting nothing. I'm just explaining everything. Haven't put nothing in there. They isn't in there. Amos 3. Amos 3 and 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the hand of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for you. God is not man. There's nobody in the history. There's no literature that man has in the history of the earth that we can find where God came down and sat and ate with the 
people other than the children of Israel. The true and living God. I ain't talking about, I ain't talking about these guys that made up with their own mind and they come up in there and put some food up in there in the temple and they burn off and then these priests in the temple sneak out, take the food and go up and eat it themselves and the next day the people come in and say, oh, the God of ping, 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 ping ate his food up. No, this God came down, if you read it in Exodus, this God came down from the mountain with eight or 70 elders of the children of Israel. Ain't nobody else have ever done that. Nobody else have ever heard the word of God. Now that's another lesson. But nobody has said, this is only Israel. Israel say, only ye, only have I known. So how did all these people know anything about this true and living God? Because it came from the word of an Israelite. Let's, let's, let's go to uh, Psalms real quick. Psalms, 140, Psalms 147. Psalms 147. We're almost done. Another three hours. <laughs> Psalms 147, pick it up at verse 19. He showed his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgment unto Israel. Now Israel and Jacob were in interchangeable names because Israel is Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And when it speak of Israel, it's speaking about the whole house of Israel. So it said, he showed his words unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He has not dealt so with any nation. As, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise you. Nobody knew anything about anything that's written in this Bible or who was not an Israelite. Let's go one more place before we go back to where we was at. Let's go back to uh, Amos 2. So only the Israelites knew God's words. Only the Israelites knew his ordinances and his statutes. He said nobody else knew them. He said he, it says, Rachel, he has not done so with any nation. As for his judgments, they have not known them. They did not know nothing about God. They did, without, until Paul, Paul said, until I came on the scene, you had not a God in the world. You were worshiping in the vanities of your own mind. Until Paul stepped on the scene. Amos 2 and 11. And I raise up your sons for prophets and, you, and, and of your young men for Nazarenes. Is it not even thus, O oh, ye children of Israel, says the Lord? So the children of Israel are supposed to be the prophets. What do prophets do? They prophesize and they distribute the word of God. So now then, let's go back to Colossians. We should have a marker there. Let's go back to Colossians 2. 16. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of new moon, or of Saturday. How did these people know anything about the dietary law to be judged and they be judged about? How did they know to keep not eat certain type of food for their countrymen to judge them by? How did they know anything about the feast days of the Lord, the holy, holy days of the Lord? How did they know anything about the new moon or the Sabbath? Paul brought that to them. But if the Sabbath was done away with, if the Sabbath was nailed with all that stuff was done away with, when Jesus died, then why is Paul teaching these people that? Why is Paul teaching these people this stuff if, if, if it was done away with? That's just something to take back to the uh, uh, jury room to deliberate on. If the Sabbath is done away with, then why did Paul, several years after the Sabbath has allegedly been done away with, is going about teaching the Sabbath to these people? So therefore, you using this verse that says, don't let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. It means that Paul did not. That means that shows that Paul kept the Sabbath and he passed the Sabbath on to the people who he was teaching. That don't mean nothing about he did away with the Sabbath. Let's go on. Let's move on. Let's go to Matthew. You're talking about the Sabbath done away with. Let's go on. Let's go on to uh, Matthew 24. We're going to see what Jesus had to say about the Sabbath. And it being done away with. Matthews 24. We're going to pick it up at. Uh, you know what? Yeah, we'll pick it up at verse 1 real quick. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there should be. Left here. One, there should not be left here 
one stone upon another that should not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us which of these things be. What things? This temple being thrown down. That's the first question he asked. And what should be a sign of thy coming? That's the second question he asked. And of the end of the world? That's the third question. So they want to know three things. So then Jesus goes on and gives them a whole bunch of things, telling about take heed and no man deceives you, because many will come in my name and deceive many. They're talking about you hear wars, rumor of wars, this and that, that, and this, and a whole bunch of other lists of things that's going to occur prior to him returning. But let's go to verse 15. That's what I'm getting at. This is one of the things that he's telling them that's going to deal with the end of the world. So now we're dealing with end time prophecy. We're dealing with stuff beyond our time right now. It says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever read it, let him understand. So he's telling when you when you see this abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, right? Whosoever read about it, here. So when you see this abomination standing in the holy then he tells you something else to do. And he said, uh, verse 16, Then let them be in Judea, flee into the mountains. Let them which is on the housetop come not down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the fields turn back to take his clothes. Why? See, this is a sense of urgency. When you see this abomination, desolation standing in all the place, Jesus is telling these people to burn. Man, don't even come down. Man, if you're on top of the roof doing whatever you're doing, man, you're taking a, a, a fiesta rest or whatever, and you watching on the news that the abomination of death. First, you got to know who the abomination of desolation is, what the abomination of desolation is. If you don't even read to that, saying, you don't even read the Old Testament. We have some churches don't even have How can you even? Man, that's another lesson. Let me get that because I'm on I've been in, man. Man, it's a sense of urgency. Why is there such a sense of urgency? Let's skip on down to verse 21. Verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, never ever should be. So we're not even talking about it now. We're talking about a future event. And the reason why, when he said you see this particular individual, go to this particular place, you're supposed to flee in all haste. Drop everything you're doing. Don't worry about who, what I'm going to say. Man, you're supposed to get out of that because once they shut the gate on you, that's when the time of tribulation is going to begin. But let's skip back up to verse 18 and read into what we're getting to. Verse 18 says, Neither let him which is in the fields return back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight not be in the winter. So pray that this, in this particular time don't occur during the winter time. Pray that your time that this doesn't occur during the winter time when you have to flee. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Wait a minute. How can I pray that this that I don't have to flee on the Sabbath if the Sabbath is no longer around? Jesus, you didn't get the memo? You did away with the Sabbath. You did away with the Sabbath, Jesus. So what are you talking about? See, see how stupid you sound when you compare what you say to the word of God? Jesus said the Sabbath day. It's still here. According to him, you saying he did away with it. Now, whose word am I supposed to believe? Your word of Jesus. You tell me. You telling me everybody everything else? Whose word do you want me to believe? Your word or Jesus' word? Whose word is going to have more influence on me and true believers? Your word or Jesus' word? See, that's that line you have to draw in the sand as a believer when you study this word of God. Whose word is going to have more influence in your life and governing and dictating the actions that you do in life? Man's words or God's words? The title of this lesson is Remember the Sabbath and Keep It Holy or Worship on Sunday. Or worship on Sunday. Whose words, which word, which, which does God command? Which does man command? We almost finished. Let's go to Isaiah, last place too. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. 
We're going to pick it up at verse 15. Another end time prophecy showing end time events. For behold, Isaiah 66, verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. We're talking about end time prophecy right here, right? This is something that's going to occur in the end. Let's go to verse 22. And I will take, and I will also take of them for, oh, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So, in time, probably talking about a new heaven, a new earth, and, if you, and, 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 and other lessons, I'll come up, I'll come to it, and I think I touched on it in uh, the lesson I did about the rapture, true or false. If you go back and look on all my different lessons I did. But the new heavens and new earth is symbolizing uh, uh, the beginning of Jesus' thousand year reign, right? So we're not at Jesus' thousand year reign yet. There hasn't been no uh, uh, battle Armageddon. Nobody's been killed yet for that. So we have not reached this point. But let's see what he said. Let me start that over. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. From one Sabbath to another. Wait a second. This is end time prophecy. And it's talking about from one Sabbath to the next, you're going to come up there and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. But the Sabbath is done away with. Don't the Lord realize that he did away with the Sabbath? The Sabbath doesn't exist anymore. Come on, man. We're going to have to grow up for man. We're going to have to grow up. We're going to have to grow up. It's too late in the game. We're too close to the finish line. And we're too far behind to continue to act like children in... in Let's go to 1 Corinthians real quick. Let's go to 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 and 20. Brothers, be not children in understanding. How be it, how be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. We have to be adults, man. We are adults. We reason. God has given us the ability to reason and rationalize things. Think things out. It's time for us to act like grown folks, even the youngsters, when it comes to this word of God and quit moving on emotions, quit moving on, 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 on slights of hands and stuff like that. We got to move on what the word of God said, what the Holy Spirit made me say. And I'm going to do a lesson on that too about tongues. Blah, 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 because this woman jammed me up on that. I'll get into that. I'll get into that when I get into that. But we have to be sober. It said be vigilant and be sober. If we're not worshiping the Lord according to the way the Lord said to worship him, then we're worshiping the devil. It ain't no in between. You're with the Lord or you're against him. Well, I, whether you're with the Lord or you're against the Lord, it's simple as that. It's time for us to be adults. It's time for us to be grown folks. It's time for us to find out what's in this Bible because Jesus said the time won't come. He said not everybody is... Let me read that. Uh, Matthew 7. Matthew 7. This is just added stuff I'm throwing in. It says Matthew 7. Yeah, Matthew 7. And uh, 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, should enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of the, ye that work in, 
all this stuff that they claim that they did in Jesus' name, Jesus is saying that those were works of iniquity. I never knew you. How is that possible? That's the wrong time. That's a dead judgment, man. That's when Jesus said, get thee away from me, he put you in the lake of fire to burn forever. That's the wrong time to find out that what you thought you believed in was false. Because if you read it, this is what leads into this statement right here. If you go up to verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets which will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenously wolves. It tell you about false prophets. People coming. Yeah, let's go back to 20, man. We're on a whole nother lesson. Boy, verse 24. This is it. I promise this is it. I'm not going to run in my mind. Verse 24. 24, uh, verse, uh, Matthew 24, and verse 4. This is one of the signs that Jesus, this is the first sign that Jesus said to beware of, to take heed of, to look for. They asked for a sign. What would be a sign of your coming? This is one of the signs that said, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. Deceive me in what? I'm asking you about telling me. Man, let's read it. It said in verse 3, it says, and he said unto he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. What are you talking about somebody deceiving me? I'm asking you about when this temple going to be thrown down, when are you going to come back, when is going to be a sign you come back, and when it's going to be in the end of the world. And you talking about letting no man deceive me. Deceive me about what? Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, say that I am the Christ, and they should, and should deceive many. How can a person deceive a person in, who's coming in the name of Christ? How can a wolf come to you in sheep clothing? He says, beware of wolves and sheep. If this man look, if this sheep look like a sheep, talk like a sheep, act like a sheep, how I know it's a wolf? He said, you will know him by the fruit you would know them by their fruit. Let's go to verse back to chapter 7. Back to chapter 7. 15 said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravaging wolves. Ye should know them by their fruit, <coughs> by their works, right? Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth Corrupt or brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree that brings not brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone who says unto me, says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name that cast out devils, and in thy name that done many wonderful works? And I will confess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Man, you're going to know these people by their fruits. But what happens if, well, how do you know what a fruit is? How, how, if, if, I, if I go to a new land, and people in the place say, hey man, don't eat any of them pomegranates, but I don't know what a pomegranate is, then how am I to beware of eating the pomegranate? Somebody's going to have to identify a pomegranate for me in order for me to know what a pomegranate is. Because if I don't know what a pomegranate is, you think that a, a person who's selling pomegranates is going to tell me, hey man, these are pomegranates. And I've been informed not to eat any pomegranates? No, they're going to tell me that, hey man, this is an apple, this is a pear, this is a plum, this is a peach. But they're not going to say it's a pomegranate. Well, it's the same thing with these false preachers. If you don't study and show yourself approved, if you don't get into the word of God and study this word of God, then you have no means to know when a person is preaching the word of God or if he's preaching that other Jesus that Paul speaks about if he comes preaching another Jesus which we have not preached. Oh, you ain't never heard of that? Stay tuned. I, got I think I'm going to do that next. That next lesson about what Paul's talking about another Jesus. Another Jesus Another Jesus was born on December the 25th. That's who another Jesus was. Another Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday. That's who that Jesus was. But you don't know this 
unless you read this book. And that is, I'm going to stress this until the day I die. If you do not read this book, when it comes time to put on the full armor of God, and when you read about that, everything is talking about it's the word of God. If you don't study the word of God, you have no means whatsoever to defend yourself from the devil. But with that, brothers and sisters, I pray that somebody was edified. I pray that I put enough information on the table that a person can make an informed decision and do some study in themselves. If you are one of the ones who believe and worship in on Sunday, believe that Sunday is the uh, day that Jesus rose from the grave. If you're one of the ones who believe that that Jesus did away with Sunday, uh, did away with uh, did away with the Sabbath day, uh, or one of the ones that believe that Paul changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week, man, I pray that you got some edification in this. I pray that you pray yourself that the Lord will open up your eyes and allow you to go into the book and get some understanding to see whether or not what I said is true or not. Just don't take my word for it. Just don't take your pre just because he just because he look like a sheep don't mean he's a sheep. Just because he got all these degrees and all these different followers behind him and he looks good and smells good and very articulate about what he's saying don't mean nothing. What did Jesus call them Pharisees? He said, y'all like whitewashed tombs. Y'all look good on the outside, but y'all on the inside, you have rotten, dead bones. And anybody who's preaching a lie to you is trying to put you in that grave also with them. But with that, brothers and sisters, like I said, I pray that I put enough information on the table that you can make an informed decision as it pertains to you, because it says work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. But you got to work it out according to what God, you can't come as you are. And I'm going to show you that in other lessons. You got to come according to the protocol that is established by God. Cain came as he was. He just picked something up and brought it to the Lord and the Lord didn't accept it. Let me stop there. Anyway, I pray that you uh, enjoyed this lesson. I pray that you got some edification from it. It's in Jesus' mighty name that I say this, and I pray that everybody have a safe week.